to Salzburg, leading its department of geoinformatics. He holds degree in geography from Vienna University and has been teaching GIS science and related subjects at universities worldwide. He is a full member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and chair of its commission for geographic information system. Also, he is, here, he is serving as a board member of, for international academic organizations in the geospatial domain and on the editorial board of leading journals in geoinformatics and GIS science. He is promoting and spreading various educational, organizational, and research initiatives. Uh, Professor Strobel will uh, give us his webinar uh, on the topic, very important topic uh, in the field of geoinformatics uh, entitled a technical, from technical speciality to a digital earth framework. Professor Strobel, give me one minute to give our audience short information about geoinformatics. Geoinformatics has been described as a science and technology dealing with the, uh, with the structure and character of spatial information, its capture, its classification and manipulation, its storage processing, including the infrastructure necessary to secure optimal use of this information, also known as the art, science, and technology dealing with the acquisition, storage, processing, production, presentation of geo information. Uh, please give me uh, a few seconds to give uh, uh, introduction in Arabic words for our, our Arabic colleagues. نظم المعلومات الجغرافية المعروفة اليوم بأنها الجيو معلوماتية. هي العلم والتقنيات مزيج بين العلم والتقنيات التي تتعامل مع هيكلية ونوعية وكمية المعلومات المكانية من حيث تجميعها وتصنيفها ومعالجتها وتخزينها واسترجاعها وتحليلها ونشرها بما في ذلك البنية التحتية اللازمة لضمان الاستخدام الأمثل لهذه المعلومات كما تعرف أيضا بأنها الفن والعلم والتكنولوجيا مزيج ما بينهم لا تتعامل مع طرق تجميع المعلومات الجغرافية وتخزينها وتحليلها وعرضها. Uh, also known uh, the expression geomatics. There is a similarity between geoinformatics and uh, geomatics. We ask Professor Straubel to give uh, information about the differences between both terminologies for our audience. Please, Professor Strobel, you have the word. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, Professor El Shinawi, we're very honored to meet you here. Mohamed Al Kassami, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and again, it's a great opportunity uh, to discuss one field of science which we share and where I have been involved since yeah, 40 years maybe uh, to share some thoughts where we are going with this. So I will not be looking backwards too much. I will most likely uh, focus on- Sorry, on would you please uh, record this uh, webinar please? Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just to pick up the question I've been asked, is there a difference between geoinformatics and geomatics? Well, uh, that would be a nice debate in and of itself. So for instance, if we were right now in Canada, where it's important to have a common denominator between French and English language, maybe geomatic uh, would be the term which is more frequently used. By and large, geomatics is used uh, for new generation of surveying, engineering, and geodesy. 
uh, so the automation of these processes. So typically a geomatics program would be anchored in uh, surveying engineering. Geoinformatics typically comes from a combination of computer science and geography. And there might be lots of other experiences. But this actually gives me an opportunity uh, to actually reflect briefly on the subtitle, going from a technical specialty. Because in the early years, what we are doing now was kind of an automation technology. There was cartography, and we wanted to automate cartography. There was drafting and CAD, and we wanted to automate technical drafting with computer-aided design. Uh, what we today do is, in a way, the opposite. We are not trying to automate uh, traditional processes. We are not trying to do the same with computers, which before we had done manually or with uh, other techniques, but not technologies. But we are today moving to what's, uh, what I describe as digital earth. What I mean with that, uh, I maybe get back to that point uh, in the end. Right. Uh, so I will invite you, and I'm happy that you join me on a little bit of a trip. Uh, this trip starts in, in a today's scenario, which we all know all too well. All of these dashboards, all of these COVID-related experiences uh, are too familiar to everyone and with everyone. But I'm actually not talking about COVID and the current crisis we are having. I'm talking about interfaces, about multidimensional information where we bring together location, time, and subject matter and aggregated statistics. So we work with multidimensional information across space, time and context, or maybe we call them attributes, to explore whatever happens in the real world. So geoinformatics, if you would ask me for a very brief definition, to me, it's the bridging of the real world with the digital domain. So having digital virtual worlds connecting with the real world. And this is what we do with geomedia like the ones I'm looking at here. Uh, and of course, that would be applicable to many, many other domains. This is luckily not linked to COVID. So with this, um, and thank you for the introduction before, I would like to invite everyone to use this little platform for any questions or comments you might have. And I will address these uh, towards the end of the talk. But this platform is open, so you could either, with your phone, uh, use the QR code and it will take you directly to the Slido platform, or you type in on any browser, on your smart personal device, or on a desktop browser, uh, you go to slido.com. And if you are asked to enter a code, just type in Galala and that should take you to the Q&A platform. Yeah, so uh, I will collect questions there and you will see when you go to the platform that you can see each other's questions. So you do not need to repeat the same question over and over again. You can say just with a symbol like that, a thumbs up, this is interesting for me too. And that gives me an opportunity to have those comments our questions prioritized. So again, slido.com, Galala, and that would take you to the platform anytime during my talk. You don't have to wait until the end. So the interface, your interface, will be looking roughly like this one. So my starting point when I talk about digital earth and the current or new generation of geoinformatics technologies is uh, cloud technologies, cloud architectures. Uh, this is not only the current 
set of platforms we are working at. Uh, it's really defining the next generation and the potential of all we are doing. And all I'm doing here, all I'm showing here, actually is working with cloud technologies. None of what I'm showing here is installed on my computer or licensed on my computer. Uh, I'm in a web browser, and that's what I'm doing pretty much all day. We all have made this experience. When we work with email, then most of us will work in a cloud environment. So we go to any computer, launch a browser, type in the address, log on, and there we are. No one really uh, would get the idea to save the inbox on a USB drive and take it with us. We can access that everywhere and anywhere. And essentially with geographic information systems, with geoinformatics technologies, we are doing the same. I don't want data on my desktop. I very rarely work with locally installed software. We work in a cloud. And this opens up new qualities. It opens up, it generates a new generation of technologies we work with, and they facilitate a lot of what I'm going to discuss here. Actually, one of my uh, favorite examples out there uh, would be the Explorers, the remote sensing technology Explorers uh, that can work with Sentinel like here, uh, and it would work with Landsat. Too. So if I log in here uh, and look around, well, this image has been taken a few days ago when there was still snow on the ground, but then it was immediately replaced with the last image taken by uh, the Sentinel satellite of my hometown of Salzburg. And as we can see on the upper edge here, it's just a few days back uh, in late February. And of course, we're all familiar with different perspectives being offered uh, by remote sensing platforms. We could go to any other place on the world. Uh, I could go to wherever I want to be taken. I could, for instance, go to the city of Tashkent uh, and move around the world seamlessly. Just think about the huge volume of data we are accessing here. It's not only everywhere in the world, but I'm accessing a complete um, archive over long periods of time. So for instance, I could scroll back and say, give me the view from say last summer, uh, September will be pretty dry in this area, right? So we'll have a little bit less wet. So all of these, views, digital views on the real world are only feasible because we throughout work with cloud environments. It would be utterly impossible to have like in this case, 10 meter worldwide coverage uh, over the entire multi-temporal archive uh, and then maybe uh, even dig a little bit deeper and check out other types of uh, classifications, indicators, and all that. So to explore the global view of uh, the current state and past states uh, would not be possible without cloud computing. And I show these examples just to introduce our department with this facet uh, as well, because remote sensing image analysis, extracting information uh, from imagery is one of, one of our specialties worldwide. Uh, and of course, we can uh, focus even a bit more on the temporal aspects. If I maybe look at the globe right here, uh, then this is how atmospheric transfer works right now. So cloud computing doesn't only give me the opportunity to go everywhere on the world, but I can also uh, work in different levels of detail. 
And this is the atmospheric movement. Uh, for instance, when I go to a higher level of atmosphere, well, the winds get stronger, so we have more reddish hues. And if I look at this cycle here, uh, and maybe step back a few days, because this is current, this is exactly how it looks now. Uh, and if I go back a few days, I would observe that out from Northern Africa, from Sahara, we had a strong stream uh, of atmospheric transportation of sand uh, to the Alps. So that's why the snow cover in the higher reaches of the Alps uh, currently uh, is covered with a bit of Saharan dust. And of course, I could explore not only the atmospheric movement, but I can also check the atmospheric content of particular matter. And if I talk about sand, I have to go uh, to uh, another fraction, more coarser uh, atmospheric contents and explore everything around here. So this illustrates combined uh, with what I had said before, that geoinformatics increasingly is growing to be a real-time analysis science. We move from mapping data, organizing them, storing them in databases, onwards to checking how things are now. And geoinformatics, above all, is a decision support technology. And sometimes I call it a what if technology. So we are not only looking into the past like with traditional mapping disciplines or into the present like here with this example, we also develop scenarios, so simulation. How would that look in the future? And if I go to my scroll bar and move into the future, then I would have forecasts for the next couple of days. So having a decision support technology requires that I need to know about now. And this is provided by a huge sensor network around the globe, which gives us the possibility to have a real-time picture. So we have covered the globe with all kinds of sensors. Sensors are everywhere, measure lots of things. Some of them are physical sensors, some is social sensing through people. We do remote sensing and in situ on-site sensing. We have stationary or we have mobile sensors. So we have built what sometimes is referred to as this nervous system of the planet. And it works with the skin of the planet. The skin of the planet, that's all the sensors. The nervous system of the planet, this is what I like to refer to as digital earth. I don't like the term digital twin so much. Maybe it's rather something like a digital cousin, but we do have very powerful digital representations of reality. So another example along those lines would be when I check a global view like this one. So I'm on one of my virtual globes and move into any area of interest and then maybe explore the weather stations and voice. So I'm now getting small arrows, which are maybe a little bit hard to read uh, for everyone in other places. But when I click on one of these arrows, we just had a brief conversation before with a visitor from Cheddar. So let's go to Cheddar to King Abdullah's airport, I guess so. And I get the weather data from there, from 11 a.m., which means that's pretty much now from today and can go to any other place around the globe. So this shows me that the digital representation is not a digitized map. It's not a static representation, but it's highly dynamic and we connect the sensors into a digital earth. And of course, all of these measure measurements around the globe, which I can access here through an interface like this one, I can go anywhere on the globe, 
check out every online station uh, which there is, even if I go to some wonderful island in the Indian Ocean, it would be from now, it's just a few minutes old, right? So we moved from a document-centric uh, technical discipline where we automated the map production into uh, a life science, uh, which is within what I call the framework of digital earth. And there is another point which is very, very important to me and which facilitates much of the technologies which now support our work. And this is the movement towards open data, towards open licenses. Because what I was showing right before with the Sentinel Explorer interface, where I can move around the world freely and scroll through time and bookmark any of those views or data, or even download the data into my own cloud storage. And if I want to, to my own local storage, I can only do that because all Sentinel data as they are provided, produced, provided and offered by the European Space Agency are under an open license. So anyone can work with them and that really empowers our discipline of geoinformatics. Of course, I'm an Austrian citizen and living in Austria, so I'm happy to explore like the local counterpart. I'm on a map, that's a live map, I could zoom out again to the world pretty much. And this map is freely available. The terrain model is freely available uh, with currently one meter resolution and soon getting better. Of course, all the aerial imagery is available and of course, various kinds of maps. And all these are not snapshots that in my current presentation can move around, uh, can go into lots of detail, just to explore the detail a little bit. We are down here to individual houses and addresses, and we can query that information. Or maybe have a little bit more of a detailed look by moving down here to this comparison. I go into one of the nice vacation places around here. Let's move up there. Uh, and, and find uh, yeah, that, for instance, seems to be a, a very nice location right here, known to some people. Uh, we can appreciate the extremely high level of detail as soon as it's moving over to you. Uh, currently, maybe we need to wait a little bit until it loads, but essentially uh, what I'm getting here is the digital surface model and the elevation model, the terrain model, uh, which is available uh, for the entire country as open data. Uh, so now we can see that a little bit better. It's the pure elevation and it's elevation covered by forest settlements and whatever we would have in there. So have all of this, having all of this available as open data, an extremely high level of detail that empowers geoinformatics. Because otherwise it's like a car without fuel if we have GIS software without data. And open data make this a real racing car, make it a very powerful tool out there, okay? So let's move on from this focus on uh, spatial data, which are over time and real time providing a current picture and an open license, which allow me to freely phrase my questions, uh, maybe moving over to a multi-dimensional perspective. Let me maybe jump in here into some of our research work, uh, which is focused on uh, urban environments. I have to identify myself briefly here because only the views but not the queries are completely public. And this shows uh, a perspective view 
but it's not a stationary perspective. I can freely navigate that uh, to one older castle, Schloss Mirabel, uh, which is known as the current city hall and the uh, residence of the mayor of Salzburg. Uh, and these perspectives do not only go to any other place around here, uh, and some of our work is actually focusing on cooperation with industry. We all know about uh, the performance of GNSS and GPS. What's currently more important is to have location inside of industrial facilities. So that's what driving some of the cooperation with industrial production plants, because what's out here in the open space well, that can be located with GNSS. Inside the production facilities, we need to use different location technologies. And that clearly needs to be uh, transparent. When we move into a building, we cannot lose the smart location we otherwise need. Or when I move over to uh, maybe one of our department facilities in an awesome part of my city uh, and <clears throat> maybe focus on that a little bit. Uh, so that would be the building in the back. Let me move that to the foreground like here. So I'm talking about this part of the building, uh, which is yeah enabled with some smart technologies. So if I go into the first floor indoor, uh, then I would even see all kinds of sensors and I could query the sensor readings as well. So I could uh, and would know about what is switched on, what needs to be switched off. So it's about smart buildings because you don't are not going to have a smart city when the buildings are not smart or not. So geoinformatics has moved into the local spaces. Sometimes we would maybe argue well, there are no um, white spots on any map anymore. Well, there are, and most of the white spots these days, they're actually the indoor spaces. So mapping indoor spaces, having building information models with sensors indoor and outdoor, uh, this is one of the research areas which we are currently exploring as well. Of course, that requires detailed models of yeah, physical reality. So if I switch over to one of the landmarks in the city of Salzburg, actually, when I look out of the window, I can see this nice castle here. Uh, and uh, if we look at that, it looks pretty much like a photo. But of course, this is a live web scene as well. And if I want to explore this a bit further, I just need to go a little bit closer and we will see in a minute the enormous level of detail. It's about one or two centimeter resolution in a fully enabled 3D model. And in this case, it's the outer shape of the building we can explore. But of course we can visit the courtyard, uh, go into this castle a little bit further navigate on our own, move around, uh, look what we are going to see, and then again, step back. So having these facilities, which make uh, spatial information fully navigable, that's one of the big differences to previous technologies where we had digital maps. Uh, on a digital map, I cannot choose my own vantage point like here and move around look around. Plus, uh, when I zoom back and zoom back and zoom back and zoom back and keep going, where I end up is the globe. So none of the models we are working with is actually isolated. It's not like a digitized map sheet or a digitally created 3D feature. No, we always on the globe. Everything is perfectly georeferenced. So as soon as I want to go back, uh, we again can enjoy the view from this castle. So that would be another key point I would like to emphasize 
that we can choose the perspective and we're always on the surface of the earth, uh, which corresponds to real life. And the last point I'd like to highlight here uh, is that all of these technologies allow public participation. I believe when I was checking this a few minutes ago, that this public participation site uh, was not working. Let's see whether it's doing now. Oh, it's back in operation. Good. So it was only a very short uh, delay before. So what I'm, I'm looking here, it's a public participation website. It's only possible because all the data are on the cloud, because we cannot send data to all the citizens involved, say, in a planning process, in a community building process, in a local improvement process where we want to keep our environment clean and tidy and as it should be. So obviously here people were confronted uh, with some planning aspects and they were showing what did they like, what are there any dislikes, any concerns, any concerns about safety. So all of these are uh, utterances of public opinion. Uh, and in this case, it's in a planning exercise. It could be many other ones. So the democratization of spatial information, I believe is quite critical. Not only major enterprises or government have full access, but because of the open license, there is full access uh, to information, pretty much everyone who has access to the internet, to a web browser. So this would be an example out of the uh, public participation domain and kind of the sister domain to public participation is what we call citizen science. And there is lots of research projects in the ecology diversity uh, domain, in the climate change domain, in the water domain, just to highlight one of these projects so we have full participation by all our citizens. And of course, this is very important to focus this in education of young people who do have the competence and skills for digitally interacting. Years ago in schools, we used to talk about map reading skills to develop and to build up map reading skills in young people to be competent and active participants in society. Today's this is about geomedia skills and geomedia competences. And that's facilitated by the sensor network, by the digital skin of the planet, connected by the digital nervous system of the internet, bringing together spatial, spatial information, which is time enabled and which provides the full context under open licenses. So that's how we moved from a automation technology. Let's do maps with computers all the way to what we call a digital earth, which is a global model of the real world, which facilitates all kinds of decisions. So to finish off, I would like to kind of offer a perspective uh, which uh, was designed by our friends at the uh, Geospatial Media and Communications in a major research initiative establishing the, yeah, where do we go with geoinformatics towards a digital earth? There is lots of contributing and enabling technologies on the left side. There is positioning, there's analytics, there's Earth observation. Just think about the um, sentinel imagery we looked at. We can fully scan objects in detail. So thinking about the Salzburg castle. This is only feasible to bring all together in a global network uh, because we work with standards and open data and have everything connected through the internet. And in order to bring all of this out into society, into business and industry, and into public administration, we need to map 
all kinds of processes, business processes in, in a wider sense. They might be more engineering focused, or they might be focused on um, trade and development or public administration as well. So all of this comes together into delivery platforms. And yeah, I'm using one of these platforms here, which enabled me to look into all of these different examples of spatial data uh, through a web browser. Sometimes these platforms are mobile and we maybe call them apps. Sometimes they are traditional web portals uh, or just running in social media because I could share this presentation in Facebook as well. And you could run it from there live and explore all of these bits and pieces in here. I'm just looking at one of the questions which were put into the chat window where it says, does what I'm saying mean that computers will in the future replace human input in geoinformatics? Um, as far as the input goes, oh sure, yes. Uh, humans will ask the right questions. And I would insist that I as a human want to be the ultimate authority with taking decisions. Uh, but all of that would used to be human input in a maybe trivial or naive way, thinking about map digitizing or acquiring other types of spatial data. Uh, this is by and large out of the window. This we would have to agree that uh, all the monitoring of the entire globe uh, would not be feasible with human activities. So to summarize, and actually by looking at this kind of nice uh, historic map on the left-hand side, which is a traditional cadaster, which is nearly 200 years old, we have uh, changed the mission, changed the mission of geoinformatics, actually quite substantially. Originally, many of what we were doing, and this is the technology to work with maps, to digitize maps, was to support systems of record. Systems of record would be a national map, that would be a cadastro of property, or that would be any other record. We have moved on, and that was maybe the era where I spent most of my time, towards systems of insight, where we use the records, where we use the data, analyze them through spatial analysis methods, and then move on and uh, create new information from data. And more recently, having mentioned the keywords of public participation or citizen science, we open up and open up using open data, open access over the internet to systems of engagement. So we move from one-way communication. Yeah, traditional cartography was an expert encoding information in visual language, putting that on the map, giving the map to other people. And if people had map reading competencies, they could decode and use that information. So that was a one-way process. But today, online live maps are not maps like products, they're not digitized products, but they are frameworks, they are frames of reference for communication, for interaction. I can, like I did a few times before, click on a map or touch a map and I would get some more detail. So maps have moved from documents to be frames of references for communication. And this is critical for what I call the systems of engagement. So anyone who wants to dig a little bit deeper into my background or into what we are doing here and uh, what I'm doing here uh, actually would give us the, uh, I would give you the opportunity to explore the background of the work at our department uh, on our homepage, zetkis.at. Uh, you might want to dig down into research into education in some of the bachelor's, master's, uh, 
and PhD programs. We are offering uh, all of our graduate programs are in English language. So we do have very international uh, European minority study programs uh, and one very attractive European master's program where we just finished the third round of applications for scholarships. So that's our education and research focus in our department. Uh, but it's maybe even more interesting to look into this video, which I'm not going to play to you because uh, a lecture like this, don't want to confuse this with a YouTube channel, but uh, you might want to go to our homepage or on Vimeo or on YouTube to look for this macroscope few minutes video. And this is not a typo because I like to use the metaphor of microscope. Quite a few sciences work with a microscope to look deep into the detail, what's beyond the reach of the human eye. And from a geography, social, uh, spatial sciences and geoinformatics perspective, we want again to reach beyond the scope of the human eye, but not in detail, but over the horizon. So a satellite image, an aerial image is a microscope because it lets me look over the horizon. It gives me the big picture. The same is true for any map. So we in our discipline, we are what I like to call a macroscopic discipline. More importantly, so is actually to look at the concept of an understandoscope, because only to see what's there over the horizon. Uh, that's interesting, but it's not really helping us with better decisions. We need to be able to answer the question, why is it some distribution of spatial phenomena, some performance of a certain process, some risk, which is maybe translated into any kind of catastrophic event. We need to understand the why in order to make better decisions. So I like to think about digital earth technologies where we just walked through uh, from an yeah, understandoscope perspective. So to just reiterate what I have emphasized, the core areas of our discipline are cloud services. That's the nervous system connecting everything. The real time aspect of monitoring the digital skin of the planet uh, by handling time actively and having live monitoring through sensors. It's important to have as much as possible under an open license, because only then a broad spectrum of experts as well as general population can do the work we are doing here. We are sure going away from the flat earth aspect of planar maps, printed maps, towards multiple dimensions. I showed a few examples of a virtual globe. We had 5D displays because it's three spatial dimensions plus time, plus context. And I was showing some indoor scenarios as well. And much of that comes together in the perspective for participation. So finishing off, um, I would invite you and I'm already glad uh, that someone has taken a start. So just remind you for the Q&A facility, going to slido.com, typing in Galala. Uh, congratulations to Yasima Gup that you managed to get there uh, or just pick up the, uh, the QR code right here with your phone's camera, that would take you there. And um, to a little bit further justify my use of the digital earth concept. I'd like to point everyone to the International Society for Digital Earth, which I'm very honored to work with. And in the beginning of July of this year, we are looking forward to what will be a hybrid conference event. Who can make it to Salzburg uh, will be very welcome. Uh, who is still, and that will be many of us, hampered by travel restrictions and other constraints, uh, there will be full online access to this event. So that will be the Digital Earth 2020. 
2021 event. That's just a, as an invitation, but I want to highlight one aspect of this. And this is the um, youth forum in this conference, where I would be happy if uh, everyone could spread the word about this youth forum. This is kind of an informal unconference. There will be no agenda, no set presentations. This is to bring young people who are the future, not only of our discipline, but the future of our society and our world uh, together. These people are even invited to a video competition to communicate well, uh, but uh, I would just invite you to look a little bit deeper into this field. Yeah, that brings me back to the Q&A. And again, I will have an eye on the chat window on our platform if that's easier for you. Otherwise, I would be happy to encourage you uh, to leverage uh, this platform as well. Uh, let me look into the chat. Uh, the links I have presented, uh, I'd be very happy to share. Essentially, that's a, a very easy way to do that. I can uh, simply type the link to my presentation into the chat window. Uh, and as soon as we finish here, uh, I will share it with everyone with the world because the sharing might not be open yet. And then you can directly follow all the links I have followed from this platform. So anyone who clicks on the link I've put into the chair right away uh, might still not go there because I need to share it and they will do so immediately after we have concluded. Uh, but the sharing link will be exactly this one. Uh, and I believe that's uh, related as well to the question which is currently on our uh, shared screen. Uh, information available for all parts of the world. Um, and the second part of the question, looking at the level of detail, that's the critical one. Uh, so for instance, when I look at the remote sensing based information, so open data uh, from a range of different satellite platforms up to a 10 meter ground resolution with a spectral resolution of a dozen different channels is openly and freely available for everywhere in the world. Uh, if you look for higher resolution, you would end up being in the commercial domain. Uh, plus that would not be available everywhere but just think about the um, data volume. When we go from 10 meter to one meter, we have times 100 the volume of information. Like for my country, elevation data is available at the one meter resolution. The best global coverage, which is again available and freely available all around the globe would be in the 25 meter resolution. Uh, whenever we go into buildings, uh, there will be uh, a broader range, uh, which is maybe focused on the mega cities of the world, on urban environments, uh, and less in the rural area. So we would have to look exactly at what kind of data we are looking at. And I consciously were replacing what's replacing the term information with data because what we share is data, it uh, turns into information when we provide context and we try to answer a specific question with that. Uh, so again, let me encourage you to put your questions on the slide or platform I'm sharing or on the chat window. I will go back to this online platform, but for now I'll just go back to the title image. And uh, as I believe I'm through the questions which we have discussed here and which have been posed, I'd be happy to turn it back over to Mohamed al -Kusami. Okay. Thank you, Professor Strobel, for this very informative uh, presentation. And I hope that our, uh, our audience uh, got